Um, we are here to welcome Mr. Toyama, who's here from, he's an associate professor of community information at University of Michigan in the School of Information. Um, and he's a fellow at the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values at MIT. Um, in 2004, he moved to India to start a new research group for Microsoft. And he explored novel technological solutions to the world's persistent social problems. And from that came this really great book uh, that I've just gotten started on called Geek Ge Hearsay, sorry. Geek Hearsay, Rescuing Heresy. Heresy. Heresy, I'm so sorry. Can you tell it's Friday? Can we all just say it's Friday? Um, thank you for correcting me. Rescuing Social Change from the Cult of Technology. Um, it's also the Tom Lee Common Book, I hear, which is an ama amazing accomplishment. Our students love it. And the students love it. Um, and his scholarship really strikes a chord with computer scientists, information scientists, social scientists, as well as policymakers and the public. So please help me with, uh, welcome Mr. Toyama. Um, thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, Hanson for inviting me to come and uh, speak to you today. Um, so uh, as you heard, I uh, did some work in India, and this was the research lab where I, uh, that I actually co-founded. I'm a computer scientist by training, and when I moved to India, it was with the mission of trying to find different ways to use digital technology specifically to address uh, the social challenges of the developing world. So um, we ran all kinds of different projects, um, but India is a very interesting place to do this kind of uh, work. I, you know, it's very unique in that in front of these gleaming, you know, modern buildings, you'll often have uh, people's cows walking in front. Um, it was probably one of the few computer science research labs in which this happens on a regular basis anywhere in the world. Uh, we ran most of our projects in India, but uh, we also had occasion to do different kinds of research around the world. And you can see most of our focus was on the developing world. And throughout, we um, borrowed a series of kind of uh, ways of approaching these things from human-computer interaction, in which basically the idea is initially to really do a lot of qualitative uh, research to understand a particular community, uh, see if there are um, challenges and problems that we could conceivably address through technology. Then we would go through a, a period of iterated, uh, iterative prototyping where we worked with those communities to try to come up with a technology solution that's addressed that problem. And if that seemed to go well, we would switch to evaluation, where we ran basically some kind of impact evaluation to see if the program actually had the uh, impact that we, uh, we expected. Um, and because we were a research lab, we didn't do implementation ourselves, but we would partner with local nonprofits and sometimes government agencies to see if we could scale up these projects. And um, we were certainly not the only ones. I went to India in 2004, around the time when a lot of this work was just beginning to uh, grow around the world. Um, uh, but increasingly, there are more and more people in the world who do think that digital technologies are the solution to persistent social challenges. So, for example, uh, Arnie Duncan, who is our Secretary of Education, says that technology is a game changer in the field of education, a game changer we desperately need to both improve achievement for all and increase equity. Uh, this quote is from Hillary Clinton, who, uh, when she was Secretary of State, uh, announced a new foreign policy called Internet Freedom, which was the idea that the United States should back freedom online uh, to the extent possible. And she says, access to information helps citizens hold their own uh, governments accountable. And here is Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, the richest 500 million people have way more money than the next six billion combined. You solve that by getting everyone online. Right? So if you put these kinds of statements together, and these are all you know, very prominent people, Basically, what they're saying is that some kind of technology, some kind of access to information effectively addresses a prominent social problem on its own. And you know, at a school of communication, uh, you know, among academics, I realize this is, you know, this is not what we normally teach our students. Um, but nevertheless, this is the dominant rhetoric. And one thing that you know, I like, you know, I'd like to challenge, especially departments of communication, is that for whatever reason, this rhetoric takes hold of the public imagination at an incredible, with incredible strength. And, um, and you know, as academics, I think we have to work very hard to counter this perception, especially if we believe that it's wrong. And uh, I think one of the reasons why it's hard to counter is because we're not um, providing an alternative narrative that is both easy to understand and compelling. And so what I'm gonna try to do is present one such uh, um, uh, a narrative. 
right? And I'm going to do it by first starting off, you know, wh where my own um, understanding comes from. So while I was in India, I was there for a little over five years. Uh, we ran over 50 different projects in which we tried to use some kind of electronic uh, technology to alleviate problems in um, healthcare, education, governance, agriculture, uh, microfinance, uh, and we used all kinds of technologies, including mobile phones, uh, PCs, uh, you know, um, digital cameras, uh, sometimes custom hardware that we designed. And <coughs> I'll talk about just one of these uh, projects that we call text-free user interfaces. So here was the original problem that we were trying to understand. So aside from people who can read either Japanese or Chinese, what is this website about? Any ideas? Well, you can probably read Chinese, so don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I can read Japanese. Oh, you read Japanese. Okay, so yeah, don't, don't say anything. Anybody else? What is this website about? Any guesses? Social Dating? Social media? social media? Dating, social media? Good guesses. Um, it's actually a job search huh. website. So my claim is that basically this is what the internet looks, like, looks to you if you are illiterate. Right? So you can tell that there is some compelling information on there. Uh, it looks very intriguing. There's a lot of information, but you cannot get any access to it. And so uh, our, one of our first projects was something that we called uh, text-free user interfaces. And the idea was to see if we could design, um, come up with design principles such that you, know, you could make user interfaces for these kinds of uh, websites more accessible. And uh, it was a very fruitful uh, area of research uh, that we spent several years on. Um, over on the right here are little images of the different kinds of UIs that we experimented with. I mean, it's not a surprise, but we basically emphasize things like use of imagery and audio feedback. Uh, some of the more intriguing things um, you know, that we found are actually, I think, things that the communication uh, field knows quite well. So, for example, we found that in using images, it really helped to use kind of hand-drawn hand cartoons as opposed to photographs. Um, and that was because with photographs, people associate the photograph with the actual instance of the thing in the photo, whereas with uh, cartoons, people understand that there's some abstraction going on, and so they think of the general, the general case of whatever is being drawn. So things like that. But one of the things that um, we noticed over and over was that even when we were successful at helping people who could not read navigate a computer user interface, uh, there was still a difference in how they performed. So people with better educational preparation separate from their ability to read. In other words, people who had gone to formal schooling for a couple of years at least, or people who seemed you know, generally more articulate and um, intelligent, seemed to do better on you know, trying to achieve tasks on the computer than otherwise. And so we actually ran a, a separate study in which we asked people to navigate um, a kind of hierarchical menu structure to find a particular object. Uh, and then we asked, you know, we had them take tests in terms of both their literacy as well as their uh, you know, non-text non related cognitive skills. So there's a series of kind of IQ-like questions called Raven's matrices that help you understand something about how people do abstract reasoning. And what we found was that, um, first of all, Everybody had trouble with certain kinds of interfaces. Basically, the more you nest information in a, in a complex hierarchy, the harder it is for everybody to uh, navigate. But in addition to that, it was exactly the people who had higher cognitive abilities that were able to navigate the user interfaces better. Um, so you know, the overall uh, idea is very simple. It basically says the more, able you, the more developed your cognitive skills are, the better able you are to manipulate computer user interfaces. Right? Very simple idea. And this, is, and this research basically shows that in one particular context. Um, so <coughs> you know, what that basically says is that your underlying capacity, what you bring to the situation when you engage with digital media, actually affects the outcome of what you can get out of it, right? So it's not that we all approach digital media in the same way and extract the same amount of value out of it. It's that different people with different capacities get something different out of it. And over the years, I, I saw this pattern over and over again, not just in that particular line of research, but in another one. In this one, we decided that we were going to annotate um, some uh, icons in a, in a user interface with actual text for people who were semi-literate. So it turns out that literacy is a continuum and there are plenty of people in the world who you know, have had some education and can actually you know, fight their way through reading the phonemic you know, uh, reading of a particular word, but they can't read, let's say, a newspaper fluently. 
Um, and people like that, it turns out, benefit from having some text tags on things because over time, with repeated use, they, be, they get better and better at reason, reading those words and they can take better advantage. And obviously, if you're literate to begin with, that can be a huge uh, advantage. Um, but we found that, again, if you're completely illiterate to begin with, then those tags don't matter. So even though you're seeing the same um, visual patterns over and over again, they don't stay in your mind because you don't have the basic building blocks to uh, be able to read them. Uh, this is a completely different example uh, and done by a group that had uh, nothing to do with us. Um, so what they were interested in was trying to understand what kind of entrepreneurs, micro entrepreneurs, benefited most in their business using a mobile phone. And what they found was if you were a strong entrepreneur to begin with, what you got out of the mobile phone was much greater than if you were a relatively weak entrepreneur. And so the, the better you are as an entrepreneur, the more likely you are to ex extract value from the mobile phone. Um, and yet another context. So this one from uh, healthcare. So what this team was trying to do was to use SMS text messages sent to uh, rural healthcare workers as a way to remind them to visit certain patients. And the goal was to increase the degree to which the healthcare workers visited uh, patients and made their rounds. Um, so this line at the top shows the uh, percentage of clients that a particular uh, healthcare worker uh, would see, and the top orange line is when there, the SMS reminder system is in place and there is a human supervisor who is there to basically scold the um, uh, health workers who are not you know, getting through all their rounds. Uh, and then this control group is basically a group that gets neither the human supervisors nor the SMS text messages. So what's interesting is when you let go of the supervisor, so when you keep the SMS text messages going, but the supervisor stops interacting with the healthcare worker, then over time the, the text messages by themselves stop having their impact. Right? So even though you're delivering the reminders, the healthcare workers go back to their old habits, which is to be a little bit less um, diligent with respect to their rounds. Um, and in all of these situations, even though they're in completely different contexts, what you find is that some underlying human capacity is necessary for the technology itself to have positive impact. And uh, I saw this pattern repeat over and over and over again in all kinds of different applications in different domains. Um, and so the conclusion I came to is that for the most part, technology amplifies underlying human forces. And it seems like a very simple idea, and it is a very simple idea, this idea that technology is a tool and that the carpenter who wields the tool matters to what extent the tool helps in terms of building the house. Um, so, uh, this is not at all new as an idea in various different disciplines, right? In, for example, I believe in communication. So Tishnor in the 70s um, basically said that, you know, throughout the history of, you know, he was already restating something that he believed that the field as a whole had already understood at several decades, which was that in general, the people who absorb public service messaging better are the people who are already better educated and have other advantages to begin with. Um, and he you know, went through several different iterations of you know, uh, evidence that suggests that that might be true. Um, and he uses the term, you know, increasing news on a topic leads to greater knowledge among the more highly educated segments of society. Basically, your underlying capacity to absorb information uh, changes what you get out of uh, mass media. Okay? And there are other examples here. Um, I'm gonna point to this one in particular, which is interesting. So in economics, in macroeconomics, there's something that's called the Cobb-Douglas function, which basically relates economic output as the product of technology multiplied by uh, financial capital multiplied by human capital, right? So I'm really focusing on this technology times human capital angle, but basically this is a straight multiplication in this model. And there, you know, there are debates as to whether this is a good model or not, but generally this is believed to approximate what happens in a larger economy. And it's basically saying that technology amplifies human uh, capacity, at least with respect to economic output. Um, now, th the thing about amplification is that even though it's a very simple idea, it leads to some corollaries that are not as easily digested. So one of them is that anytime you see positive impact with a technology, the claim is that it is amplifying some underlying positive human force. So without that positive human force, uh, you will not get positive uh, impact out of technology. Um, and in and of itself, what this means is that technology doesn't fix <coughs> dysfunctional institutions, it doesn't shrink inequalities, and it doesn't make things more democratic. Uh, um, and so what I'm gonna try to do over the next few slides is basically you know, provide some intuition for why these things are true. Okay, so I'm gonna do it through a series of questions. 
so the first one is this. Okay, so if you, uh, it says poor rural farmer, but just imagine the poorest person that you know who is involuntarily poor. Okay, it could be somebody who is homeless that you you know see on the streets every day, or it could be a poor rural farmer. It could be a poor uh, resident that you work with at a nonprofit. Um, and think about this question. So imagine that you and that person both have one week's access to the internet, unlimited, free and unlimited, for the period of a week, and you're both trying to raise as much money for the charity of your choice. Uh, who would be able to raise more money? You, the people in this room, or that poor person? Who thinks you? Okay, most hands have gone up. And who thinks the other person? Okay, good. So why you? Why would you be able to, why, we, why are you better able to do this? Yes? Okay, so th they might, yeah, so you have computer literacy. Yeah, they don't even know how to use the technology. Okay, that's one, certainly. Anybody else? Yes? You have richer friends. Yes, you have your richer friends, absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah? I think you know what to look for. You know what to look for uh, in terms of what? Um, uh, like, well, I don't know, everything. Like resources online? Resources sure, or absolutely. Good, yeah, so y that's right. So you have uh, more skills finding resources. You're probably better equipped to organize your friends into helping with a campaign for something like this. So, you know, the interesting thing about this thought experiment is that the technology is the same, right? But the outcome is dramatically different based on who is using that technology. And so it's an illustration that who you are, what capacities you have, who you know, and who your friends are is the thing that causes a difference despite keeping the technology the same. And you can run this experiment by changing the technology. So let's say you and the poor uh, farmer both are using a mobile phone, or both are using a landline phone, or are both using one week's access to Facebook, or pick your favorite communication technology, the results will more or less be the same. Um, and also you can run this experiment uh, the other way. So imagine you're competing against Bill Gates or Bill Clinton. Okay, who would be able to raise more money? Um, well, we already know the answer to that. Uh, thanks to you know, the Clinton Global Initiative and so on. Um, so this idea that the internet flattens things and democratizes things is a myth. It, what it, you know, when technology spreads, it certainly spreads access and reach of something, but it's not fundamentally flattening the world, uh, so to speak. Um, <coughs> so again, an illustration of uh, amplification. Okay, next series of questions. So who here is as rich as they would like to be? Anybody? Usually I get more yeses in the academic crowd, but. <laughs> okay, who uh, are you as educated as you like to be? Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Are you as educated as you like to be? Anybody? Okay, that's why you're at a university. Some people, <laughs> hopefully the professors are reasonably happy. Um, are you as compassionate as you like to be? Anybody? Okay, a couple hands. So um, for the most part, very few hands went up to all three of these questions. I'm gonna claim that you already have all of the, you have access to all the information that you could possibly want to be these things, right? And that is, of course, the wonder of the internet. Um, if you Google how to be rich, there are 41 million hits plus. Uh, and of course, some of those you know, sites are, the, the advice is questionable, but many of them have a very good, solid advice about how to, how to uh, increase your wealth. Are you as educated as like to be? Well, today, thanks to massive open online courses, you know, whatever your interest, there is somebody out there who has, you know, who can basically show you uh, what you need to learn. Um, and as far as uh, being as compassionate as you'd like to be, I found this site about you know, cultivating compassion in your life from the Dalai Lama. So the information is all there. Why is it that you are not able to achieve these things when the information is all available to you? The perception problem. Percep meaning what? We encounter all this information that makes us notice a gap between what we have and okay. what we should have. Okay, so basically you're saying your, your expectations are too high. <laughs> or we're just getting hammered over the head. That our or, or yeah, we're being, or we're being led to believe that our expectations should be higher. Okay, that's possibly true. Anybody else? That's definitely um, one, one reason why this happens. Motivation. Why else? Motivation, right? So you might lack sufficient motivation. Anybody else? It's hard to put some of these vague things into practice sometimes. Like, oh yes, be compassionate. List things that sound nice. How do you actually do that? Right, so sometimes the, the information is too vague. Um, and this is all true. And I would say that you know, you know, the people in this room are a reasonably privileged segment of the total human population on Earth. Right? So imagine if we all have problems with this, 
with the information that's available on the internet. Imagine how much harder it is for people who have, who lack the education that we have, who lack the kind of reasonable amount of comfort that we have to be able to take on additional uh, psychological tasks. Um, so this idea that information in and of itself is a bottleneck is also flawed. And one of the worst ways in which this idea is abused is this belief that if you put the information online, everybody suddenly can educate themselves with that information. Um, that has uh, never really been true, and it's uh, still not true today. <coughs> um, all right, now I'm going to ask everybody to start off with your hands up. Okay, so everybody hold your hands up. And lower your hands as soon as the answer to any of these questions is no. Okay, so the first question, should members of the army have guns? Anybody? Okay, there are some people who are, look like, appear to be complete pacifists, all right? Um, should police officers have guns? Okay, fewer hands. Uh, should ordinary civilians have guns? Okay, a lot of hands have gone down. Should five-year-old children have guns? Okay, most hands have gone down. Okay, in some audiences, there are still hands left, <laughs> believe it or not. And so I have to ask this last question. Should convicted serial murderers have guns? All right, so here, I'm not talking about digital technology, but obviously the, the technology here, the gun, is the same. And yet your idea of whether or not it would be used for positive or negative ends depended not on the technology, but on the context and the person you thought was going to use the technology. So I would argue that that is also true of um, communication technologies. Uh, for example, once upon a time uh, with television, you know, in the 60s, people used to think that this was a device that was going to end the need for physical schools because you could just pipe not only audio, but imagery right into the living rooms of all of our families. Um, why would kids ever need to make that trek to school when they could get all of that education delivered into their, right into their houses? Uh, today, we of course know that television is used for reality TV. Um, and basically what this shows is that whatever the potential for technology is, what it actually gets used for is dependent on what people tend to want to do with that technology, which in the case of television turns out to be enter uh, entertainment. So whether you believe that's you know, positive, negative, or something in between, whatever it is, the technology is amplifying that desire, not, um, not imposing its own uh, ideals. So uh, one more question. <coughs> so this time, imagine you're the CEO of some uh, for-profit company that has a good product, but is missing its sales targets and not making a profit. Okay? Which of the following uh, options do you think is most likely to help turn this situation around? So I'm going to give you several options. So A is create a new strategy. B is replace the leadership team. C is provide more training to sales staff. D is to buy iPads for all employees. Okay, so I'm going to take from your laughter that you don't believe that. E is upgrade the data center. Um, F is give employees productivity software. So, uh, you know, you laugh, and it's, I think that's the right response. Um, but we take with very, you know, with considerable seriousness the idea that if we have a broken school system or if there's inequality in our schools, that somehow that is going to be somewhat ameliorated by using a certain kind of technology X. And I would say that that is as ridiculous as this idea, that you can fix uh, failing for profit with technology. And the interesting thing is the same venture capitalists and CEOs who understand this very, very well, then go out and market their technology products as a solution to other people's problems, right? And we are living in that culture to the point that, you know, as a society as a whole has kind of absorbed that marketing uh, message. Um, so this idea that technology fixes bad institutions uh, doesn't make sense. So what do we make of these statements made by um, our various leaders? Um, I'm going to go through these one by one. So technology and education. Uh, at this point, there is quite a bit of very rigorous uh, research, um, often using randomized control trials, that shows that, for example, handing children a laptop in no way improves their grades, test scores, attendance at school, uh, rate of disciplinary actions, uh, uh, compared with kids who don't have laptops. So this idea that somehow kids just learn on their own with technology in a way that helps in a measurable way is uh, deeply misguided. Um, and that's true in the United States as well as internationally. Uh, when I was still living in Seattle, I, would, um, I volunteered for an organization called the Technology Access Foundation, which is in South Seattle. And they run an afternoon uh, program for uh, children in which their goal is to teach them um, some kind of computer literacy. So uh, in the class I was teaching, we would teach them um, uh, how to make YouTube videos, how to program you know, Lego robots. And what I found was that the greatest obstacle to teaching them about technology was technology. Right? So anytime my back was turned, this is, this is what would happen behind my back, which is to say they would find some game from somewhere. And I was almost sure that I had eradicated all the avenues to these things, and they were still very good at finding these things. 
Um, you know, people often say, well, then why shouldn't, shouldn't we just gamify the, pro, you know, the productive learning things? And the, thing, the trick is that, you know, if, as long as you're trying to turn a game out of something that's educational, you're competing with the best games whose sole goal is fun, mm -hmm. right? And so if children have a choice between something that's designed for fun only versus fun plus broccoli, they never want the broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> And that's you know, one of the huge challenges. I found that in this case, you know, the only solution was to ask them to turn off their laptops except when they were supposed to do class projects on the laptop. And it's kind of counterintuitive that in a class about computer literacy, you should ask students to um, you know, turn off their screens. But that was really the only way to uh, preserve the right kind of class atmosphere. Um, this is Lakeside School in, uh, in Seattle. Um, it's where Bill Gates went. And uh, understandably, there's a lot of technology there. The kids all tweet their athletic results. They email their professors. The professors post assignments online. Um, all the kids are required to have a laptop. So I spent uh, a few months there a couple years ago. And I was there to, as a paid substitute tutor for some of these kids. Right? So basically, what that tells you is that when the parent, very wealthy, privileged parents of kids who are already doing pretty well want their kids to do a little bit better, what they want most for their kids is more adult guidance. Right? And I believe increasingly this is understood in, you know, again, in well-educated circles, which is to say we are working harder than ever to remove screens from our children's lives. Um, we are doing everything we can to make sure that our kids grow up you know, at least somewhat familiar with the physical world around them, uh, and not just the digital one. And, and we're doing this increasingly for our kids. But at the same time, society as a whole is trying to ram more technology into the public school system, into you know, all kinds of places. And I think at some level, it's almost a, it's almost a hypocrisy. Many of the parents who, go, you know, who send their kids to these uh, schools, are, are, um, they work at technology companies by day. Right? So they're, again, in this mode of pushing more technology as a way to solve uh, deep social challenges. But they don't believe that that works for their kids. Uh, what about access to information? Um, in a political context, so you know, this is of course an uh, image from the uh, Egyptian revolution, which was often called a Facebook revolution. Um, I think that is problematic for a number of different reasons, and I'm going to walk through why that is. So in both Libya and Syria, uh, there were some protests that were organized online. And because the dictators in those countries saw what happened in Egypt, you know, they probably thought, I don't, I don't want to have a Facebook revolution in my country. So they shut down the internet within days after the protest started. Uh, well, in Libya, the protesters kept fighting. They, of course, eventually toppled their government. Um, in Syria, uh, the rebels kept fighting, and they're still in the middle of a civil war, which is now, I think, into its fourth or fifth year. Um, so what that tells you is that the technology isn't necessary to actually uh, uh, try to uh, overthrow your government. Um, and of course, we have evidence uh, in the United States that you also don't need technology to run a revolution. Um, I sometimes say that. You know, if the Egyptian revolution is the Facebook revolution, we should call the American revolution a lantern revolution because of one if by land, two if by sea. Uh, the tool that you use to communicate isn't as important as the fact that there's some compelling reason to uh, have a revolution. And then finally, in China today, there are something like 700 million people who have access to the internet and over a billion people with mobile phones. So if you believe that the mere presence of technology causes some pressure to be more democratic, then China is a suggestion that that's not the case. And if you put these things together, what it tells you is that technology is neither necessary nor sufficient for revolution, which suggests that whatever role technology plays, and I do believe it has an ampli amplification role, um, it's not a primary cause of this kind of social change. OK, finally, what about inequality? Uh, so this is the one where um, the corollary from amplification is the most obvious, and yet it's the one that I think runs most counter to our other intuitions. So while uh, I was writing my book, I spent a lot of time in public libraries. And what's interesting about America's public libraries is that they, during the day, a good chunk of the homeless population from that area often spends their time at the public library. And you know, I saw many of these people over periods of months and they would, they would spend a lot of their time online. They were not going anywhere. So whatever else they were getting from that online experience, it was not contributing to their you know, getting a better life uh, in any significant way. Um, here's a more fun example. So this is Kickstarter, uh, which was you know, widely held as a way of uh, democratizing fundraising. So now, if you're online, you, anybody can start a Kickstarter campaign. Anybody can raise money from their friends. Uh, except that if you are a famous actor-director like Zach Braff, 
and you are trying to raise money, you can raise well over $3 million through Kickstarter, whereas the average Kickstarter campaign raises like $6,000. Right? So there's a huge gap in what the technology does for you depending on what your social influence is to begin with. Um, and then finally, massive open online courses. So again, when they first came out, people thought that this was going to revolutionize education, particularly for the least privileged people who could not afford a real uh, university education. Um, but the data is now in, and very consistently what it shows is that the people who complete MOOCs the most are uh, college-educated professionals, not high school dropouts looking for jobs. Right? So exactly the people you would want to deliver an education to are the ones who are not using the technology uh, for that purpose. Uh, and finally, uh, just to you know, put a final nail in this coffin, so this green line is the rate of poverty in the United States since about uh, 1960. And you can see uh, from the 1940s until 1970, it basically declined very consistently. And then since then, it's been more or less constant. Uh, the ups and downs are due mostly to economic recessions and so forth. But our poverty rate has not declined much in the last 40, 45 years. Those 40, 45 years are the same years in which we basically had a digital revolution, right? In which we've had all of the inventions that we now think of as uh, digital media, and they have penetrated every corner of our lives. Um, you know, one of the amazing things is that you, these days you find people who are homeless who still have a mobile phone with a smartphone and they have access to Facebook and so forth. So all of that digital technology, widely disseminated, has not put any kind of dent in the rate of poverty. And I'm not saying that the digital uh, technologies are responsible for that, but it basically suggests that um, if you believe amplification, it just means that as a society, we are not focused enough on eliminating this particular persistent social ill. And so all the technologies in the world don't actually focus on that particular problem. So they persist despite the amazing technologies. So uh, what does this mean? Um, you know, technology amplifying underlying human forces is, you know, it still says that technology is very powerful and it does interesting things, uh, but it just means that we have to be more conscious of what the human forces are that they're amplifying. And so the flip side of this is that for technology to have positive impact, it has to have, uh, you have to have the right human forces in place first. And so the question is, how do you get those things aligned at the same time? Um, so there are many sort of situations in the world in which we should just not start with a technology solution. Um, sometimes the right human forces aren't in place. So this is an example that doesn't have much to do with digital technology, but which I thought was interesting. So I went to visit uh, the man in the center here who ran a project in central India in which he was trying to get these agrarian communities, communities to adopt, adopt what are called check dams. So these are these dams that, flow the, uh, that slow the flow of water in a river just enough that um, the local region gets saturated with water. Right? It doesn't actually stop the water, but it, it kind of holds it back a little bit. And what he found was that using check dams, these communities could basically get in two harvests a year when they previously could only get one. So merely by building a check dam, they doubled their effective income. Okay? So he thought, though, that they could actually do even better. And he, and he basically tried to convince them that these communities, that if they adjusted their planting schedule a little bit, they could get three seasons in a year. And at that point, the villagers rebelled. They said, who is this old man who's coming around trying to make us do more work when we are quite happy that we have just doubled our income? Right? So this is a situation in which, you know, and you know, these people, um, the people in these communities, maybe they earn a couple of dollars a day even after the doubling of their, uh, of their um, yield. And so you know, this is a situation where, as an outsider, we might say, you, know, you people are destitute and poor. You know, why would you not want to increase your income? And they're saying, no, we are quite happy because we have just seen a major jump in our income. You know, things that we couldn't do before, we can do now. Um, this is a kind of situation where you know, no amount of technology is going to quote unquote improve their lives because that desire to do that is not there. The uh, people themselves don't have the aspiration for it in that context. And I think that's perfectly OK. Um, if you have a technology, uh, the one advice I always give is that the best way to apply that to positive social change is to find an existing social trend or an existing organization uh, which is already achieving the eventual goal that you're seeking and doing it well. So for example, if you are you know, interested in preventing malaria, then find an organization that is good at that. Uh, and then you will often be able to find a way to apply technology to, that amplifies the impact that they're already having. So uh, one project that we did in India was called Digital Green, in which we used um, uh, digital video in a particular way to help uh, smallholder farmers 
uh, learn better agricultural practices. And we found in an evaluation that this method of using video was 10 times more cost effective in convincing farmers to adopt uh, better practices. Um, but it is entirely dependent on have working with an organization that it has good rapport with actual farmers. So, uh, you know, since our initial pilots, uh, we have spun off Digital Green as its own nonprofit organization. And the way that Digital Green works is that it looks for other organizations that are already very good at agriculture extension, which is the reaching of farmers uh, with agriculture education, and basically teaches those organizations the methodology so that they amplify what they're already doing. Without these other organizations, there is no Digital Green. It's not that the videos themselves are doing the magic, it's that there are human beings involved that the farmers trust and the videos amplify what those human beings are doing. Um, <clears throat> and then the other side of all of this is that uh, if you believe that technology amplifies human forces, then if you get the human forces right, then all of a sudden all of our technologies uh, work in the right direction. They work for us rather than uh, against us or indifferently. So this is a photograph of uh, Shesi University. This is Patrick Ewia, who used to work at Microsoft. He was recently awarded the MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, uh, and he founded this university. Uh, he basically left Microsoft because he wanted to help find a way to provide the opportunity that he felt he got uh, by getting a full scholarship to Swarthmore University. Uh, he was originally Ghanaian, raised in Ghana. And he wanted to provide that same kind of education to uh, Ghanaians uh, so that they could get that education without leaving the country. Um, and today, uh, Ashesi is now, I think, in its 12th year. And they don't reach a lot of students. You know, at any given point, I think they have 400, 500 students. But what Patrick argues is that, especially in places like Africa, where you know, maybe 5% of the population is college educated, uh, you can expect that those 5% are going to be the ones who are leaders of the country in another generation. And so if you educate them well and uh, instill the right kind of values in them when they're college students, you know, they conceivably will transform the country later on. So even though it's a relatively small impact in terms of the number of students it reaches, it could have a much larger impact later on. Um, and nurturing that, you know, nurturing that human capacity basically means that the country will better, be better able to use the technologies that it has um, as they uh, grow up. Um, and finally, uh, one last example. So, you know, I often get asked this question, well, um, you know, educating people is great, but how does, how does that scale, right? Because education is incredibly time and effort and uh, money hungry endeavor. Um, you know, how do you get these things to scale? So, uh, there are plenty of social movements that, you know, people have had over generations that are, that reach massive audiences. And we don't still understand exactly what it takes to cause these things, but they occur with enough frequency that we should not be afraid of trying to cause social change in a way that is, you know, person to person and so on. So one, one question I often ask is, you know, what does it really mean to cause a country to become economically, uh, economically productive? Um, and there's a tendency to think of these things, you know, where you think of the country as a machine and you twiddle a few policy knobs and out comes a more productive machine, right? But the reality is that uh, countries are made up of human beings and those human beings really need to gain something in order for the country as a whole to become more uh, productive. And, uh, you know, if you think of the difference between somebody who has had no education, you know, is barely able to uh, uh, sustain themselves um, on a farm versus somebody who's able to get a job in Silicon Valley, the difference is profound even though you can't visibly see it, right? And all of that change is happening inside of their minds. And it often takes a couple of decades to achieve. Like the education that you need to be a good software engineer, you know, it arguably takes 10 years at least. Um, so, you know, what is an analogous situation? Uh, I was raised um, I was forced to take piano lessons when I was a kid. My parents made me play the piano, and I hated every hour of practice, but my mom would sit with me you know, every evening and make sure that I practiced 45 minutes to an hour a day. And after 10 years of that, you know, I was able to play the piano to a reasonable degree. 
Now, the thing about music is that we all intuitively understand that it is not something that you can learn overnight, right? There's no policy knob that you tweak that suddenly causes the entire country to become uh, musicians. And there's no technology that enables that. There's no, you can't have a fancy metronome, you know, it's not enough to have MP3 players, you know, you can't have a, you know, incredible keyboard. Um, in order for you to become a good musician, you would just have to practice, 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 and the society around you has to support you in that endeavor. Well, you know, can you do that at national scale? So this is a picture of El Sistema, um, an orchestra. Uh, El Sistema is a, is a um, organization in uh, Venezuela, and it was begun in the 1970s by a man who was an economist and a, a classical musician. And at the time in Venezuela, because of oil money, they were able to hire good European classical musicians to form orchestras that were, Venez you know, that were uh, based in Venezuela, but they didn't have any orchestras that were made up of Venezuelan musicians. And so this man, Jose Abreu, he said, you know, why can't we not grow our own musicians? And so he started a small orchestra, bringing together whatever young people he could find, uh, some of who could play instruments, some of who could not. And he started holding rehearsals. And over several months, he basically got them to a point where they could play, you know, reasonable music together. Uh, he had some of the better musicians mentor the younger ones and so on. Um, and by within a couple of years, they were performing for the president of Mexico, and then another couple of years, and they were on, they were on international tours, touring all over the place, uh, and they got amazingly rave reviews. Um, today, El Sistema now basically teaches something like 400,000 students across Venezuela. Uh, it is a national phenomenon where everybody, the country as a whole has embraced classical music as something that they believe is part of their national um, uh, you know, heritage. Uh, apparently, you can go to rural areas and people name their cows Mozart and Beethoven. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, it's amazing. And this man, Gustavo Dudamel, was tapped in 2007 to be the music director for the LA Philharmonic, which is one of the world's best uh, symphony orchestras. So, in the space of basically 40 years, you know, this country that had very little classical music talent went to a country in which it is arguably probably the most classically musically interesting place on the planet, right? It's 40 years. It's a long time in some scales, but it's not so long. It's, a, you know, maybe a generation, generation and a half. Um, so I believe that if we think of social change in this particular way, that we will accomplish a lot more than giving every kid a fancy gadget or you know, trying to find ways in which to use the technologies that we have to tweak them. Um, the ultimate change has to come from inside. Uh, so finally, I wanna talk about um, you know, where the technology itself is, is headed. So uh, I'm a computer scientist by training. I used to work in an area called computer vision, which is the automated um, understanding of uh, imagery by computer. And I used to think when I was in graduate school that we would never achieve, or at least not in my lifetime would we see computers get to the point where they can just, uh, they can be given a photograph and identify what the photograph contains. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, several researchers, uh, a group at Stanford and a group at Google were both able to do this task, at least to some reasonable level, right? So basically, you know, they train on the thousands and thousands of uh, millions and millions of YouTube videos, graphical images they have, and it turns out that we now are at a point where we can, we have some, the computers have some understanding, quote unquote understanding of actual imagery. And this output is really interesting because if you run the machinery in reverse, it creates these dreamlike landscapes, right? And they're amazingly eerily dreamlike, right? I mean, they're, you know, they evoke things that you might see in your, in your crazier dreams. Um, and to me, this is an indication that we are really on the cusp of what, uh, you know, the technology uh, industry calls the singularity, which is the point at which uh, computer technology exceeds human intelligence. And what's scary about that moment is that after that, it is widely anticipated that computers will get smarter at a, at a ridiculously faster rate because they'll be able to train themselves to be even smarter than we've made them, right? And at that point, what you have is what I think of as the, as the digital equivalent of an atomic bomb. And everything that, you know, all the digital technologies we have now are like, will be like plastic toy guns compared to this technology. And what's the most scary about this fact is that unlike nuclear weapons, which are mostly in the hands of, you know, at least reasonably responsible governments, this technology is likely to be in the hands of, co of corporations that believe that their primary goal is to serve shareholder value, right? They are not accountable to the public on the whole. They are not, their goal is not to make society a better place, but to find a way to increase their profits. And if with, uh, if you, again, if you believe technology amplifies 
underlying human forces, then what you'll have is mega corporations who are just better and better and better at extracting profit from the rest of us. Um, and, the, and the only real solution to that is, again, human. Um, we, we can't address this from a technology standpoint. So just to give you an indication that this day is not as far away as you think, okay? <laughs> so uh, anybody know what this is from? Matrix. The Matrix, yes, the movie The Matrix, okay? So in The Matrix, there's an advanced technology that harvests human energy to feed machine masters while offering the illusion of a pleasant life, right? Remember that. Well, Facebook is an advanced technology <laughs> that harvests human attention to feed shareholders uh, while providing all of us an illusion of a pleasant, uh, pleasant social life. Um, you know, I'm not saying Facebook is the matrix, um, but we are going in that direction where we are happily handing over, you know, the most important part of our lives, which is our attention and our time, and handing it over to these corporations whose ultimate goal is not to make, you, uh, uh, make your life better, but to serve their shareholders. And I think the only solution to these things is ultimately political. Um, we have to uh, find ways to basically uh, contain and limit the power of uh, these corporations. Um, and, that, and that is ultimately a political question. It won't matter how much uh, technology we use, we ultimately won't get there. So uh, if you're interested in these kinds of ideas, um, I have a book that just came out in May, Geek Heresy. And uh, to summarize, technology amplifies underlying human forces. It, in and of itself, it means that technology doesn't fix broken institutions, cause democratization, or alleviate inequality. And the main insight is that for technology to have positive impact, you have to have positive human forces in place first. And so one way or another, that has to be the case for the technology itself to serve us. Uh, thank you very much. Or comments, disagreements. Just with, with the neo thing. Yeah. So if that was an external blue pill, green pill that allowed him to awaken to his reality. Yes. But in your book, you write about internal transformational epiphanies. So since we're in a place of learning, what are some of the conditions necessary to actually create these internal transformational epiphanies? Um, that's a great question. So in the book, I talk a little bit about how I think you know this. Uh, uh, actually, let me start with a different different things. So um, if you look at transcripts of college commencement speeches, uh, it turns out that about half are about how you should serve social causes with whatever talents you have. And then the other half say something along the lines of chase your aspirations. And you know, the follow your dreams, chase your aspirations line of you know, thinking is so popular that you have to ask, why do we believe this so much? And I think it's because it's through chasing your aspirations that you actually grow, not just in terms of what you can do, but what you become interested in doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, for those of you who are going to be in Anita's class tomorrow, I'm going to talk a little bit about this with respect to my personal life. But, you know, it's when you achieve certain things that you really have wanted all along that suddenly you realize, oh, this thing is not giving me the happiness that I always thought it was going to give me. And you, your mind becomes open to other interesting things, right? And I think that as you get rid of one desire after another by chasing them, you increasingly are left with, you know, things that are more socially um, positive. And so, uh, you know, as cliche as it is, I think the best way to awakening that in yourself is really to, to first of all, know what your real aspirations are, and then to, you know, chase them mercilessly. Yeah, I guess my shift is as someone who's leading or working alongside students in a classroom to create the conditions where they own their own aspirations right. without yes. forcing them to bring no red pill. Right, 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 absolutely. So what are those, yeah. Yes, I, I, I completely agree. So, you know, I sometimes find myself in the paradoxical position of, despite believing all of this, <laughs> of advising students who really want to use technology in some way to help them try to do that. And, the, you know, I think the important thing that you can contribute is to help them do it in a way that they're, they're doing it with open eyes and, you know, with full consciousness so that whatever lessons they might learn along the way are absorbed. So you mentioned a lot about having the right human forces in place. It kind of struck me that a lot of the examples were in like particular locations. Okay. But do you uh, see this more on a macro scale too? Like maybe is capitalism in general a negative human force that 
in preventing us from achieving? Yeah, so I actually don't think capitalism is negative in and of itself, but it is if it's the only force or if it's the defining force, right? So I think capitalism is great as a force for basically helping human beings achieve one of the things that they want, which is increased wealth, right, and more economic activity. But if that's the sole goal, then I, it does lead to all kinds of pathologies. And so, you know, you need some other framework that basically balances out the pathologies of capitalism or basically reroutes them. And I think, you know, the, the closest thing that we have to that right now is basically progressive government action that skims something from, you know, what capitalism gets and then makes sure that it's delivered to more people. I'm Jason, uh, you know, and I, I, I've read your work and I really appreciate it, especially on the edu education technology side. You know, we've been telling people in the learning sciences for a long time, like, stop throwing computers out of people. Like, <laughs> this isn't helping our school, the infrastructure is bad. Um, so on that one side, I'm like, I'm really like struck by the, the talk and, uh, and the quotes. But on the other side, like, you're also a designer too. And, and it's like, it makes it, it hurts. I'm like, oh man, like, <laughs> like, like I build these things and, and it's, it could be good or bad. So I guess my question is like, from like an HCI standpoint, like when you're yeah. talking to designers, yes. now that we have this like knowledge of amplification, like what can designers do or like, not, is it nothing? Like, I'm sorry, like whatever you No, know. that's a great question. Um, so yeah, some of my background is also in HCI and I think of HCI as we are the conscience of the technology industry. Right? Uh, there's nobody else in the industry that thinks of it as their primary goal is to serve human beings. Um, you know, everybody else is worried about shareholders or about the technology itself. And so I think we have an immense um, you know, mandate to basically help the technology industry uh, do the best that it can do in terms of actually being socially positive. Um, and that can happen in multiple ways. One is, um, you know, as much as I understand your, uh, your pain as a designer, because I am also a technologist and I feel that, uh, I think we have a responsibility in the same way that doctors say, you know, first do no harm, we should also be first do no harm with technology, right? So just because you're professionally a technologist doesn't mean that you have to solve every problem with technology. In the same way that just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you have to prescribe medication every time a patient comes into, the, into, uh, into your um, office. Um, and so I think there are some cases where you have to say, look, this is not a technology problem. We need to address it some other way. And that should be the advice that we give as, let's say, HCI people. The other thing is that to the extent that you might work in an organization that has an immense amount of technological power, um, you know, you're kind of at the fulcrum where you're unleashing potentially very powerful forces to the outside. And so to the extent that um, both they can be designed, but also internally within the company, people can, can be convinced that the technology should be used in a particular way. Uh, I think that can have a major difference. I mean, you know, these days we spend a good chunk, a surprising amount of our time on platforms that are entirely owned by private corporations, right? So even if you spend only 30 minutes on Facebook, I mean, that's amazing if you think about it. That's, you know, it's 2% of your life on, in the hands of a private corporation. So if that corporation makes the right kinds of decisions, that could be a, not a bad thing, right? But if it makes the wrong decisions, you know, multiplied by the billions of users, it's potentially devastating. So um, I think, you know, people who are in HCI have a huge, uh, both, you know, they both have power and responsibility to change that. Yeah, it's sort of, sorry, to sort of understand, like, also, like, as a designer, like, what are the positive forces that I'm sort of looking into? Because like, right. sometimes, like, so, for example, you give that sort of like, poor rural farmer, but one, one aspect could be that, what if this farmer speaks the language in that country better than I do, right? and sort of understanding like what are the perspectives we have of like the deficits that people that we may, may or may have. Or, or more of a, a, a positive perspective of people that there is like, there's like, what, how do we identify these sort of like creativeness of people and then think about it then into our design of the tech. Right. Yes. So I'm wondering where tech or digital literacy fits in your work. Mm -hmm. um, background. So Jason is at the iSchool, I'm here in the Department of Communication. We're trying to work together to identify ways um, to help families be able to access resources better, okay. whether they're related to health, sure. education, or anything. And as more resources and information are digital, uh, there's an additional barrier to yes. that access. Yes. Um, so it's unavoidable to try and improve literacy based on tech and digital access. Right. Um, because the technology is so pervasive in right. family life, in everyday yes. life. Yes, yes, yes. 
Um, so I'm just wondering what would be your take? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I again go back to uh, you want to work in a framework or with an organization that is trying to achieve that final end that you're looking for. So for example, you know, if you're really trying to help connect, uh, let's say, poor families to some government service, um, you know, there are plenty of organizations that actually already do that without the digital part of it, right? And you, if you work with them and help those families get the digital technology in that context, then they'll understand that, first of all, they will actually trust you because otherwise, whatever thing you throw out there is just as good as spam. Right? Um, you know, the average person will be like, well, why should I use this? Uh, I don't know why this organization would give this thing for me, you know, to me for free. Um, but if you work in the context of another organization that's really trying to help those families, then those families have a reason to trust it, and you have an institutional home for the work that you do so that you don't have to keep, you know, keep, uh, keep um, maintaining it over time because they have an incentive for the same reason that you do to make sure that thing is working. Right. right. So work is, is it's harder. It's <laughs> harder. It is, it's harder and it takes longer, but the, the, uh, the, the flip side of it is you, can, you get the illusion that you're spreading something in many places, but it's actually not having much impact. Yes? Uh, yeah, I agree most over of her, but I somehow came across on your next slide that you cannot just compare ICT power with the offline human power because they're just taking very different spells. Like, uh, ICT is actually are building up some niche markets, the like of long term markets is ICT does not have big value that doesn't matter because without ICT, no human power will come to that place to save the people like Coursera. You can always say that uh, it is important uh, mostly the educated people, mm -hmm. but you can also say that without Coursera, no one will care about those people in class. Then we do not have enough offline resources to save those lives. So it is the most economic way to use the ICT technology to solve a little bit of the right. problem. Um, I'm not sure that that's true, uh, and I don't think that we have enough data to show things one way or the other. I mean, you know, I could argue that the impact that you have, if you took the same resources that are, let's say, spent on Coursera and reallocated them to educating just 100 human beings on the planet, but at high, you know, at high level, it's not, I don't think it's immediately clear that one is better than the other. Um, we, you know, the reality is we just don't yet know. Um, but that is the argument for why we should solve, you know, why, why we should use technology. Is people want the large scale impact, even if it's very small uh, on an individual basis. So. Yeah, I would say, just on Right, right, right. Technology can be a useful tool, but they possess this wisdom that accumulated through millennia as incredibly important. Right. So, you know, bringing that out to the extent that you can is helpful. Um, you know, one thing I was saying at lunch is that, uh, you know, we keep turning, we keep expecting technology and the spread of it to somehow equalize the world, but there has never been a technology that has fundamentally upended the social economic. Um, differences that exist in society, even though sometimes they cause some, dis, you know, some disruption at the top, right? Where you know kings get overthrown and they, and then they get replaced by the next, auto, you know, aristocrat in power. But it's never been that you know farmers end up becoming the kings as a result of a technological invention. And so, as long as your interest is in alleviating inequality, we're looking at the wrong place if we think that more in, in, in invention and innovation is the. We also say that like. Right. Like, are those things that like necessitate? Uh, I mean, I think you you have to have ramps for wheelchairs to make the society build, but in those ends, those are things that are also supporting. You know, they do, and you know, by the way, I'm not saying that technology is bad. I'm just saying that you know the the value of the technology tends to accumulate at the higher economic and privileged scales, right? So all of these assistive technologies, I mean. You know, I worked in India where we worked with blind people. They, they are struggling because they can't get JAWS, which is a $1,000 software to be able to read you know, computer software. I mean, they would do this funny thing where they would get the downloadable version and then reboot their computer every 45 minutes so they can use the technology. Um, so you're right, the technology has the potential to do this, but whether it gets evenly distributed to everybody is still a social and political question, not a technological one. So I, just, I think we have to, to 
we go until 3.30 or something today? Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to, I think we have to bring everything to close. My name is Hanson Hosein, by the way. I'm the director of the Communication Leadership Graduate Program here. And we brought Kentaro in for this talk. And I'm gratified to see so many people from across campus being here. Uh, we made his book, uh, the common book for our graduate program this year. And we just love a lot of what he's saying. I think our graduate program students really appreciate that. When he was talking about what technology can potentially equalize uh, income disparities, I mentioned the guillotine in uh, <laughs> revolutionary France is something that does uh, that. But I just, generally speaking, um, I think it's just really important that we have these conversations, especially in this technology focused graduate program that we have. And I really appreciate you, Tara, giving so much of your time. He spoke at our lunch and he's speaking in one of our classes tomorrow. Um, and I just thank you very much for Thank you. Thank you.